by the things that they face and how they're able to overcome them. Uh, as I said, it's quite an exciting book last week. We, we talked about uh, the fact that you've got floods, you've got famines, you've got uh, persecutions. Uh, you've also got the history or the beginning of the, of the church, uh, how people became Christians in the first century, how the, the things that they faced because they came from a Jewish background and they were leaving behind a whole culture in a sense and some of the impacts that that, that had on their life. And well, as we look through the book, we're going to see that uh, the church grew uh, in leaps and bounds from, from, the, from the far very first day of Pentecost where 3,000 people became Christians uh, right through to the, to the end of the book. And we see thousands literally uh, coming to, to Christ and leaving behind all the, the, the backgrounds that they, they were uh, involved in. And it brought special challenges. Uh, and it uh, helped them actually to demonstrate a love that they, they probably hadn't quite experienced up to that particular time. They saw fellow Christians in need they saw fellow Christians being challenged, they saw fellow Christians being persecuted. And against the, uh, that background, it brought out the best in them. And in some cases, it brought out the worst as well. We're going to see that uh, uh, also. But in reality, um, sometimes we'll never really know what we're capable of until we're really challenged. Uh, there's a story, uh, it's supposed to be a true story, of, of a, a woman who was, um, uh, her child was run over by a car. And the, the, the child was actually uh, caught up under the wheel. Uh, and this woman lift, literally lifted the front of the car off her child. Mm -hmm. Now, if you'd gone to the back the next day or even the day before and said to her, I bet you can't lift that car, I bet you couldn't. Uh, it's amazing what we are capable of under certain circumstances. Uh, and the church in the first century, you see people challenged. Uh, by the different things that came their way. Uh, and I'm sure that they found reserves of strength that they, they really didn't know they had before. And hopefully as we look at the practical applications of that and see it work in their lives, we'll get some benefit out of that. We'll be challenged ourselves and want to be more like that, want to understand more about what it was that led them to lead such different lives uh, and the relationship they had with God, the walk with Jesus, the difference that Jesus made in their life. And hopefully as we uh, in interact with that, uh, we will be encouraged in our Christian faith to, to be just a little more loving, a little bit more benevolent, a little bit more courageous uh, and deep in our spiritual relationship, our walk with God. And, and so uh, hopefully we're going to get all of that, or some of that at least, out of the book as we continue to study it, uh, which hopefully will begin uh, the actual text next week. <coughs> so uh, what we, as we look through the book then, we've got... Um, uh, tempered by evangelistic zeal. Uh, if you've got something good you want to share with people, if you, you know, I said last week, if I bought a new car, I would want to tell you about it. I want to show it to you. I want to, you know, show you all how the knobs and everything work, but I've got to figure it out by then. Um, but, and that's the same with our relationship with God. When, when we meet Christ, when we understand that Christ is able to deal with our sin, He's able to deal with our guilt, He's able to give us a, a brand new start, which is really, for many people, something that they want. You know, if only you could turn the clock back. If only, if only I, I hadn't made those mistakes, but I have made them. And yet, in Christ, we can have a fresh start. And because of that fresh start, uh, it means we've got something that the world really needs. Uh, and therefore, we ought to be aware of the, the reality that we've got something that is potentially world-beating. But because of, of lots of different reasons, people don't see, A, see the need of it, and B, they, they, they don't realize it's for them, it's available to them. And so we have challenged, uh, they were challenged in the first century uh, to take the gospel into the whole world, to, to share the good news of Jesus with everywhere, everywhere they went. And, and that's what you see throughout the book, even in the persecution. Uh, in Acts chapter 8 it says, they went everywhere gossiping the gospel, talking to people about, I've got something in Christ that you ought to have and, and it's worth having. Uh, and sadly in our day and age, sometimes we, we are so familiar with the gospel, we lost that excitement. Uh, we're so familiar with the benefits of being in Christ that we've, we've forgotten that a lot of people out there are crying out for some of the benefits that we take for granted. And uh, it's just a reality. So hopefully as we see the in evangelistic zeal of the first century church, uh, it will light again uh, the uh, hearts and minds of us to, to see that we've got something that, that really the world needs. And therefore evangelistic zeal is uh, something. But Overall, love is the key. Whatever you do, you've got to do it in love. You like that, didn't you? <laughs> the, uh, whatever you do, you've got to do it in love. You've got to show us that, didn't you? Yes, yeah, <laughs> I did. Mean, yeah. I was hanging up. 
uh, hoping it would work. But the, uh, the reality is, it, it, in everything that we do, that's got to be the key. It was the driving force of God. And he challenges us because he, he says, uh, we ought to love because he first loved us. And that's an important facet, facet of everything. It was love that, that uh, allowed Jesus to, uh, or made Jesus, if you will, uh, take on the form of humanity. Philippians chapter 2 talks, talks about he, he emptied himself of the glory of heaven to become a human being, took on a, a human form in order to be, to be able to be an example to us, but also to be our redeemer, ultimately to pay the price for our death on our behalf. And that's something that's it's motivated by, by love. So whatever we do, there's lots of people do lots of different things for, for lots of different reasons. Uh, some of it's financial. Sometimes you'll do something for somebody because he's paying you well. Uh, and you've got all sorts of different things going on there. But in reality, love needs to be our underlying key, the, the, the bedrock of the reasons why we do anything uh, in our relationship to God in Christ uh, for one another and for those that we meet. Um, so, as we go into the, uh, uh, further on into the introduction to the book, we're going to see the, or, the overall organization uh, of uh, the book of Acts. Uh, it unfolds and shows a different facet of uh, life in the first century. And as we see it unfold before us, we need to appreciate the, the growth of the early church. It was dynamic. That's about the only word you could take to describe it. Dynamic. 3,000 people saying yes to Jesus in one day. 5,000 a couple of days later. Uh, and as you see, the church burst onto the scene, if you like, in that first century, uh, and take the world by storm. By the time you can to read the book of Colossians, it says that the gospel has gone out into all the world. So, as we see at the beginning, it's challenged to go from Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, uh, and into the uttermost ends of the earth. And by Colossians, Paul returns right and says, it's everywhere, the gospel's gone everywhere. And we've even got here in Hadrian's Wall, we've got some uh, Christian uh, writing graffiti, would you believe, in the first century. Uh, and they probably part of either the Roman army or a follower of the Roman army. He ends up over here in Britain in the first century. He's writing, and he's a Christian in, in Britain in the first century. And the, the, everywhere the Romans went, everywhere the soldiers took the, the, the might of Rome. Uh, and as the message of Christ uh, inflicted itself amongst the Romans, and uh, Roman soldiers themselves, you end up with Christians in practically every country that they touched. Remember a good old Paul later on that we're going to see him change to two guards. Uh, and they must think, you know, we've got him, we've got him just where we want him. But after we preach the gospel to him for maybe six months or a year, they, they'll maybe want to get away from him and, and uh, get somebody else to guard him because they've had enough. Uh, and, and those, the impact that Paul would make upon uh, those who were technically, he was their prisoner, but in, in reality with the gospel, he, they were his prisoner uh, because they couldn't get away from him. Uh, he had an impact. And, and so you see the Romans. Uh, Roman soldiers carrying the gospel, and it even spreads up into the very uh, uh, hierarchy of the of the Roman leadership. Uh, so the the church grew, and we need to understand why it grew. They were excited about the faith. They found something in Christ that they didn't have in the old Judaism, and in the in the Gentile world, they found something in Christ that they didn't find in the idols and in all the pagan idols that they used to worship. And when we come to uh, Acts chapter 17, we're going to see Paul challenge them. Uh, the Greek leaders of the day, the Greek orators of the day, and saying, I can tell you about a God that you need to understand about, an unknown God. Uh, let me let him, uh, let, him make, let me make him known to you. So, uh, <coughs> we're going to look at um, uh, a lot of misunderstandings in the book of Acts, a lot of misunderstandings about how people have become Christians, what, what is involved in Christianity. Um, in Acts chapter 2, they weren't called Christians in Acts chapter 2, they are still called disciples, or, or followers of Jesus. It wasn't until Acts chapter 11, which incorporated the Jew as well as the, the Gentile into the church, that we see that God uh, brings his special name, when we come to Acts chapter 11, we'll deal with that. And, and so they became Christians in Acts chapter, or known as Christians in Acts chapter 11. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need to understand all the ramifications of that, uh, and the misunderstandings that some people have. Uh, and uh, hopefully, as we go through it, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully make things clearer rather than muddy the waters, okay? Uh, though that may be debatable, but we'll see. Um, so, a, the uh, book of Acts really is a... I've got, I've got to find my mouse. See this technical? So that side, all right. Should be somewhere there. The, um, the book of Acts 
uh, when I, when I teach on a Wednesday afternoon, I'm, the, the screen's on this side. So, um, um, anyway, the, uh, <laughs> it's a consummation. It unfolds the application and fulfillment of the plan to redeem mankind. God, right from the very beginning of time, before man sinned, God knew that man would sin, and he envisioned the time when his son would die for mankind. Uh, and therefore, all through human history, especially the Jewish nation, God set about unfolding this great scheme of redemption from the beginning. And as we, as we uh, look at that, hopefully we're going to understand uh, a, a bit more about that. Uh, we're going to see the fulfillment of prophecies of the Old Testament. We're going to see the fulfillment of prophecies in the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, the, the word kingdom is used in many different uh, shapes and forms in the Bible. Uh, whether it's a national kingdom, whether it's a spiritual kingdom, whether it's a, a, a physical, uh, a isolated uh, na national kingdom. Uh, it's got many different uses. But in reality, by the time we come to uh, the book of Acts, we're going to see that the kingdom that Christ has promised uh, is tied in with the church that Christ has promised. Uh, the people of God are called out people of God. And we see the prophecies come into uh, reality uh, in this book here. Uh, of uh, which uh, the book uh, Daniel spoke, and also uh, of which the son of David would rule or reign, but obviously it's Jesus. So we see the beginning of the church, the growth of the church, and the spread of the church uh, throughout the world, even as Christ had uh, uh, talked about. Uh, and some of the main characters, I may get back on there and do that then, if you don't want to do it that way. <laughs> so, we understand how people became Christians in the first century. You know, the promises of God were to his people. And if we want to accept those promises or be part of those promises, then we need to you know, share in those promises. We need to become the same kind of people that they did in the first century. Uh, there, are, there are many people around today, for example, who, who have huge religious organizations and yet don't believe in Jesus. Uh, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses are very, very active, and yet they don't believe in the same Christ as revealed in the first century. And so we need to understand uh, what is the first century Christian church all about? What is first century Christianity? How did it come into being? Uh, and, and how did it expand from there? Uh, and what's involved? What kind of people were they? What did they do? And, and uh, how did they get on with their lives in the first century? Uh, and the reality is, if they became Christians in the first century by following, being followers of Jesus, and they gain the promises, all the promises of God that was found in Christ, as the, as the writer of Ephesians talked about, in that first few 11 verses of, of uh, Ephesians, uh, the phrase, in Christ, uh, and, and similar phrases to that, is repeated time and time again. We are in a relationship with God, in and through the Son, Jesus Christ. And if those promises were available to those in the first century, then there are the same promises that are still available to us. And if we can become Christians the same way as they did in the first century, then we will get the rewards exactly the same as they did in the first century. Uh, it's a bit like uh, if you like apple pies. If you have a recipe, a first century recipe for apple pies, uh, and uh, somebody comes along today and says, I'll make an apple pie. So, oh, very well, I look forward to that. And they come along and it's full of pr uh, prunes and, and plums. You think, well, what happened to the apples? Oh, well, I couldn't be bothered with the apples. But it's still a pie, isn't it? A pie is a pie. But I was looking for an apple pie. What happened to the apples? You know, and that's the reality. Uh, when they dug up uh, uh, the, the store cities of, of uh, Ramesses and Pithom, uh, or whatever, Rams, anyway, and <laughs> the Old Testament uh, uh, close. stories. Close. Close. It is close. I just can't get it right. Uh, it's, uh, when they dug up those cities, those story cities, they found some, some grain inside, some corn inside, that had been buried way back in Moses' time. And they planted in the field, and what do you believe? It produced grapes. Did it change? I suppose it's, no, it didn't. It produced exactly the same kind of uh, grain that, that Moses was familiar with in his lifetime. And that's amazing. No, it didn't. It's stuff being produced after its kind. So if we, want to, if we want to be faithful to the Word of God, if we want to produce after its kind and gain the promises of the Word of God, then if we do the same thing, then we'll get the same rewards. We'll get the same promises that were available to them today. And, and we can hopefully follow that example today. So, uh, we need to uh, examine the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you think about uh, back in, way back in Genesis, uh, God spoke the world into existence. But it wasn't alone in that situation. Uh, the Son, according to John chapter 1, 
uh, which existed as the Word in the beginning with God. And it says he was God. So uh, the one who we know as Jesus was in his deity uh, was part of that creation. Uh, God said, let us make man in his image. And it says the Spirit of God moved over the waters. So all of what we understand as deity or Godhood was involved in creation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, uh, as we now understand them, all involved back in creation. Uh, and uh, God uh, began the work of redemption. Jesus, by his death on the cross, almost, you could say, fulfilled that work of redemption in, in that aspect. He, 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 he paid the price. He died. And in John chapter uh, 16 and 17, it talks in terms of that he must, he must go, that the Spirit can come. So we live today in the age of the Spirit, if you will. Uh, the, the Hebrew writer says that the, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, able to, to separate between joint and marrow. Uh, the Word of God is the revelation of the Spirit. What God wants us to know, the Spirit inspired the apostles and the others to lay down so we can read it today. So we have a share, a common bond in that which the Spirit has revealed. And therefore we need to understand that an important uh, part that the Holy Spirit played in that first century church and continues to play today. And so as we look through the book of Acts, we're going to see that. Uh, we may be confused with some of it, but we're going to see it anyway. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have a look at the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the, in the redemption, continued redemption of man. How, how um, uh, he plays his part in the overall uh, scheme of things, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so, an overview of the book of Acts. It's a story of Christians from the resurrection of Christ to the very first, uh, from the very first missionary efforts, primarily by Peter and Paul and, and some of the other apostles. And when we come into, uh, we'll look at it a little, little bit more later on. Uh, and it was written by Luke. Okay, we're going to have a look at that. Uh, how do we know it was written by Luke? That's a good question. Uh, so look first at the title of the book. And the author, and the date, and the chronology, uh, and the fair purposes of the book. Okay, I'll just put one more up there, and I will. Okay. A several way of analysing Acts. Some people, when they when they look at the book of Acts, they think about okay, primarily it's a historical book. You remember in the Old Testament, you you, you divide up the Word of God. Peter talks about rightly dividing the Word of God. So you've got 39 books in the Old Testament, and you've got 27 books in the New Testament. Then you've got, in the Old Testament, you've got five books of law, or the Torah, where God re revealed, first of all, to the Jewish nation, well, first of all, brought about the Jewish nation, and then revealed the Jewish nation. Then you've got uh, 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 12 books of history, uh, which talks in terms of uh, the, the, basically, God's dealings with the uh, the Jewish nation as a, as a nation, through the uh, kings, uh, the initial single kings in the divided kingdom, you know, what they call the United Kingdom and the divided kingdom, uh, broke it up there. <laughs> then inside there you've also got books of poetry. Uh, for example, the Psalms would be a, a classic example of that. The book of Proverbs, full of really interesting sayings, uh, and it's divided up in that way. Uh, law, history, poetry, prophecy. Uh, the called the major, major, some major prophets, like Isaiah and Daniel and people like that, and then minor prophets. So there's a division taking place in the Old Testament, and if we can understand who's speaking and who's he speaking to, and the historical context in which it's found, then we can understand better uh, what God un uh, wants us to know about the Old Testament. Well, it's no different when you come into the New Testament. We talk in terms of the New Testament, we talk about 4-1, 21-1. Uh, it can be split, split down uh, lower than that, but Four, we talk about the four Gospels. They talk about the life of Jesus. Jesus coming to earth, how he lived his life, and how he died for us. And then we talk about one book of Acts, a historical book. So the book of, of Acts is seen as the history. What happened when Christ went back to heaven? What happened when he instituted the beginning of the church? How did, they, how did that church become a church? Uh, what kind of people were they? How did they get involved in, in Christianity? Uh, and then... Uh, as, as ever with people, you always have problems. So if you like the next 21 letters, uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and all those others, 
they deal with problems in the first century. You know, sometimes when we live in, in, in our age, we think the church hasn't got any problems. Well, we, we know the church today has got problems, but we think the church back then didn't have any problems. But wouldn't have had 21 books of the New Testament if they didn't have some problems that in there, that, that, that challenges for the first century Christians, uh, that the Holy Spirit saw the date. And because characters is the same, because our same greed, the same jealousy, the same envy is around today as was way back then, if we look at how the church dealt with it way back then, then we can apply many of those lessons for us today. We can learn just as from the examples of the first Christians, from the early Christians. And so as we, uh, we can look at the book of Acts, uh, one book of prophecy, I'll that in Revelation. Um, but when you go back to the, Acts is a historical book. Acts is a history of God's people in its beginning as their relationship with God after the death of Jesus, until Jesus comes back again. So it's a historical book beginning the story of the, of, of the church in the first century. Uh, other people look at it, okay, a, a book of conversions. You have uh, how people became Christians, how many became Christians, and, and because they came from different backgrounds, how, how, what did they have in common when they became Christians? Uh, so you get historical, then you get geographical, because uh, the first chapter talks about uh, the gospel going out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there's, there's a geographical situation, how the church behaved in Jerusalem, how the church then expanded into Samaria, and, and what impact it had, and what happened to some of those people, uh, and then continued as it goes off. So you see Peter, begin, well you can then, uh, there's another breakdown, you can do it by person. Uh, it, it's called, we're going to look at that, the, the name of the book in a second, I won't go to that, but the Peter uh, is the prominent character in the first few chapters. Then you get a, a Stephen, he comes on the, on the scene very quickly and goes very quickly, uh, and then uh, Peter continues through a little bit further, and then you've got the Apostle Paul, and you've got Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Mark, uh, and the story continues. So you can actually look at the book of Acts uh, historically, geographically, uh, the story of conversions of the early church, a historical book and, and, and its implications. In fact, later on, when you come to the near the end of the book of Acts, when you have the, uh, the shipwreck of, of the Apostle Paul, uh, historically, it, it's supposed to be one of the more, most accurate uh, depictions of uh, a ship's journey and a shipwreck in, in that time that it we have from that time. It is. It is one of the few existing people. Yeah. Uh, so you get the whole story, and it, historically, it's, 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 it's very accurate. Uh, it could be done <coughs> in Lloyd's, probably getting sure. Um, but, uh, so you can look at the book of Acts in lots of different ways. And uh, there's uh, several outlines that we're going to look at later on. But the most common title for the book of Acts is uh, found in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, in some Bibles, you'll see different names for it. I need to understand that the titles of, in, of, of the books of the Bible are, are usually added by man. So anything that man usually adds a little bit later, uh, they, they can get either wrong or they get different, or they, they you know, you, you can play around with it a little bit. Uh, and so you can with these. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, it's not the Acts of all the Apostles, because only a couple of Apostles are going to be involved in these Acts. It doesn't tell you anything about the Acts of Apostles in Egypt. Doesn't tell you anything about the Acts of the Apostles in Ethiopia. Doesn't tell you anything about the Acts of the Apostles anywhere else. Uh, it just is concerned with this, this particular area in the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus. Jesus from Judea, Samaria, and, uh, and as it spreads out. Um, so it's the Acts of some of the Apostles. And that's uh, an interesting uh, understanding. Uh, there, there's lots of people who have uh, tried uh, to uh, come up with different things. But really, the title is not made, not God inspired. Some have said that the book of Acts would be a better name, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, or Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so you can uh, put in whatever title they like, but actually that doesn't change the actual historical text of the book. The most accurate title, which some would say, would be some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. But that's, again, it's only a man-made thing, so it's uh, debatable. So, uh, according to verse 1, and you'll get there next week hopefully, uh, <laughs> The author describes himself as having written a, written a former book. An examination and comp uh, comparison of the book of Luke indicates that Luke was the author of both books. And Luke describes himself as being an eyewitness uh, to some of this by using the pronoun we. So Luke was involved in the story uh, at certain points. He had a very close connection to others who were involved 
in the, in the historical aspect, and, and he wrote what the Holy Spirit uh, wanted him to, to lay down for, for all time. Uh, he'd already written one former book, and obviously we understand that uh, as the book of Luke. And I, I'm going to save some of that for, for the actual introduction when we come to the actual text, because some of that's in the text. So I'm not going to go into that too, too deep uh, at the moment. Okay, so a lot of, uh, because Acts is a historical book, but also because it's a very controversial book in today's age, uh, there's a lot of people trying to, to bring the book down. Uh, and they spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to pick holes in, in the story of this Luke. Uh, 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 I'll give you a look there. Marvellous. <laughs> look at the Holy Spirit. So it, it gives you a uh, sunlight. Uh, it, it couldn't have been a, 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 a historical book. Uh, so, some of the famous people in history, I mean, I'm, I'm one, one man called Ramsey, uh, he actually deliberately went out to Palestine around that area to disprove that Luke could have written the book and that the book was historically accurate. And he spent about three years uh, digging around and digging up different things uh, and he ended up, he became a Christian. Uh, he said, this book is, you know, it's, 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 it can't be read, it's uh, historically accurate. Basically, basically he said, if, if Luke says there's a stream there, there's a stream there. I used to remember, my father used to read uh, cowboy stories when I was young. And there was uh, one particular writer, which his name escapes me, it's almost, I can see the name, but I can't get it. Uh, it's a long time ago. But anyway, he, he was, used to write historically background novels. So this, his character may be f uh, fictitious, but the places he wrote about, in the background of the book, or the preface of the book, it says, if he says there's a stream here, there's a stream. And if he says there's a mountain, there's a mountain. And that's like Luke. Uh, Ramsey came back from his experience and he says, this man, is historically accurate. I can't beat it. Uh, there's a couple of interesting little uh, pieces of, piece of uh, history that uh, Luke seems to refer to that put certain things at certain times in certain places. And other historians are going, oh, no, 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 Luke got it all wrong there. And then this, uh, what do you call archaeology in the spade, uh, dug up the, the, the situation, and Luke has been proved time after time to be right, to be more accurate. And so therefore that's, uh, that's something we can have confidence in because if, if Luke was an accurate historian, then if he, if he was proven historically uh, uh, accurate in his geography, if he's proven accurate in the places and the people and the times that he was dealing with, then we can trust his accuracy in a lot of other things. And therefore that's the way we, we have with the book of, of Acts. We can have confidence in the book of Acts. And that's good because our faith is based upon a, a, an understanding of our relationship with Jesus Christ uh, that, that enables us to approach God and call God our Father. Now that whole <coughs> premise is based on the, on the idea that we can have conf can we have confidence in what the Bible says? Some people say, I can, believe, I can be a Christian but I don't, need, I don't need the Bible. I can be a Christian but I don't need Jesus. Oh, I believe in God, that's all I need, I just believe in God. But then you ask him simple questions like, uh, it, it, what kind of God do you believe is? God of love? And where do you, where, why do you believe God's a God of love? Well, John 3.16 says, well, that's the Bible, you know. You can't go to the Bible that you don't believe to prove that God does exist, you know, and what kind of God he is. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, a, a mixed up uh, background that they have. So we have to have confidence that the God that we understand is the God is revealed in the Bible as a whole. Then we have confidence that the Christ that we believe in, who died for us, is the Christ that's revealed in the Bible overall. And we have need to understand that the Holy Spirit that talks about that uh, and uh, lives in our lives is real because the Bible tells us that's, that's the case. And so we have to have a confidence underlying everything that people believe has a certain assumption built into it. Even, even an atheist who doesn't believe in God assumes certain things. Uh, and we who do believe in God assume certain things. And the question is, is our assumptions uh, better based than their assumptions? Uh, and I believe, uh, in, in my experience, my lifetime, that I, I believe that's the case. I think I've got uh, more reason to believe than I have to not believe. Uh, and uh, we can have confidence then in what the Word of God says. Uh, but we can't obviously, there's a certain element in which we, it's based on our faith. Um, but historically, uh, the, the book that we call the Bible, uh, people for 2,000 years have been trying to pick holes in it. 
more than any other book. And in reality, it still stands the test of time. Uh, Plato uh, and Aristotle and some of these other uh, famous writers, some of the earliest manuscripts we have of their time is 800 years after their, their existence. And if you went to Oxford University or, or Cambridge University a moment and says, well, I believe in Plato and I believe he wrote this, and they would say, quite right, quite right, we believe in that too. And then you say, and I believe in the Bible, because I believe in the Bible. And they say, well, we don't believe the Bible anymore. Oh, no. Even though there's thousands, literally thousands of manuscripts dating right from the time of Christ all the way through. Far more than Plato. Far more written than Plato. Far more copies available than ever for Plato. I think Plato's on eight, eight copies in, yeah. in the world. Uh, but eight copies, that's all the copies of Plato's writings that there is. There's literally thousands of manuscripts <coughs> dealing with the Bible, and, and therefore we can have confidence in it. And so when we come to the book of Acts, it's a historical book, and it's an accurate book, and we can have, have uh, confidence in putting our faith and trust in it. Uh, Luke himself is an interesting character. Uh, when you consider that the first century Christians, the very first Christians in the, in the, in the church of, of the Lord, were Jews. Uh, the first 3,000 people that gave their lives to Christ were Jews. Now that's maybe uh, a little bit difficult for us to stand, uh, understand 2,000 years later. But when you think about it, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. For thousands of years, God had uh, dealt with a nation in order, to, uh, all historically and prophetically, to bring about there is one who is coming and he's coming through you. And he will bring salvation and redemption to the world. He's your Messiah. He's, he's the, the anointed one of God. Uh, and therefore, everything in the Jewish scriptures, in the Old Testament, pointed to the reality of who Jesus was. Uh, uh, Jesus, at one time, he, he says, uh, you, to, to the Pharisees, he says, you search the scriptures. He says, in them you expect to find life. He says, they tell of me, and yet you reject me. That's, in my, that's a liberal translation. That's in my, my translation. But that's the reality. He says, these are testifying of me. And I'm standing here before you. And you don't believe it. Um, there's a, 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 in one of his books, Jimmy Wiggin talks about uh, a time when he spent in America. And uh, he used to write letters back home regularly. And uh, his family would get together. And they would read letters together. Because they were missing, the kids were missing their dad. Uh, and the, his wife is always in the cinema, and they would pick up a letter, we'd, they'd sit as a family, they'd read the letters together. And uh, he, he goes on the story, he says, I, I come home, and, and just as I arrived, they'd received a letter, and you can imagine a situation where if, if they're reading the letter, and he's knocking at the door, and they say, don't worry about whoever's in the door, we're busy reading the letter. And then Jim walks into the, into the living room and they're busy reading the letter. And Jim says, hi, I'm home. And says, shh, we've got a letter from our Jim. You, know, you can imagine a situation. That's like Jesus. Uh, he says, all these letters, all these Old Testament uh, books are telling you about me. Here I am. This is me. And they say, no, 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 push off. Well, let's read the books. Uh, and, and they miss the whole, they miss the whole point. Uh, Luke was a Gentile. Luke's a Gentile. And so he didn't have the historical background uh, of coming from a Jewish race, which is, makes his writings all the more uh, authentic. Uh, he hasn't got an axe to grind. He hasn't got to show Jesus as the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for all these years. He doesn't need to do that, but he does it anyway. Uh, in his reality, he's a Jew. He's a Gentile, uh, which is very, very interesting. So. Uh, actually, I said probably, but uh, in actual fact, he, uh, he was more than probably, okay, uh, uh, historically. And he's also, an inter another interesting fact, I need to speed that up, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting fact, thing about Luke was, he was a doctor, Dr. Luke. Uh, and we've got a, a, a really nice um, uh, film series, I think some of you guys have seen it on uh, Luke, uh, on the boat, as he's telling the story, and it's based upon the text, quite, quite uh, well on the text. Uh, but he was a doctor, and uh, you can imagine that would be a very useful commodity to, to have, a uh, skill to have in his day and age. Uh, I don't suppose he has access to all the theatres and stuff that we have, uh, so he'd be quite a skilled, <laughs> skilled man. There's also something else interesting about a doctor. Doctors tend to be precise. 
they tend to be detailed people. Because when you, you know, uh, they say it's even worse when you're a vet, because uh, an animal doesn't tell you, oh, I've got a bad back, you know. The vet's going to figure out even more than a doctor has. But in reality, a, a doctor is going to be able to have insight, he's got to have uh, a good ear to listen to what you're saying, to try and read between the lines, because you don't always know what you're wrong with. Uh, and, and, and I'm talking about doctors in those days, maybe doctors these days are slightly different. But in reality, they've got to be, they've got to be quite aware of people, they've got to be quite intelligent people, because they're, they've got to uh, diagnose what your problem is, and then hopefully come up with some sort of solution for it. Uh, and therefore, like, it's an interesting skill for him, being a historical writer, because he, he has an eye for detail. Uh, and there are certain things that come through the book uh, that uh, are obviously uh, doctor's phrases. Uh, and uh, he, he just has a, just a, that, that way of saying things. His, his, his uh, background comes through in some of the phrases and, and, and things he uses as, as he goes through the book. So he was also uh, another interesting thing about Luke. He was on uh, with the excitement. I could tell you, you're just hanging in there. You see, <laughs> an actor's historian. So at the end of the day, you put all that together. He's a Gentile, and he's dealing with something from a Jewish background, Jewish system, and, and yet he's one of the new breed, uh, a Christian now, and, uh, where both Jew and Gentile have been united together in Christ. Uh, and he's been part of that, seen it all happen before his very eyes. He's traveled with the Apostle Paul. He's been uh, involved in, in, in hundreds, if you will, if not more, conversions of people, people who, who have come to Christ uh, from all sorts of backgrounds. And, and I would think it'd be an exciting time he's come through. And it, it really adds a lot of emphasis to, to the things he picks <coughs> out to actually help us to understand the, the first century Christianity. As it, as it grew in its infancy. So action is demonstrated by its unity to the work of the same author. It is unified by diction, style, and by leading ideas throughout. Its doctrinal, doctrinal un unity is rarely questioned. You, usually people pick holes in the book of Acts for other things, but really doctrinally the apostle, uh, Luke has got it just, just right, uh, right uh, uh, he's got it right on the mark. Uh, and therefore uh, the whole book uh, has a, an authenticity about it that we could have confidence in. Okay, uh, the date of writing the book, a little bit of um, a interesting background to that. Uh, the period overall covered is involved in that date, uh, and also uh, the chronology as it works its way through. Okay, so the date of writing, um, probably some of the things that is, uh, historically uh, Luke writes about uh, it uh, talks about a guy called King Agrippa. Now, uh, obviously he was talking about King Agrippa in his life. The book couldn't be written before Agrippa died. Otherwise, you know, he wouldn't mention his death. So that gives you an indication of it can't be earlier than 90, in, in AD 44. Uh, there's some other, uh, of course, that's in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. It also talks about a famine in AD 46. That's, that's 11, 28, AD 46. Uh, there's a famine talked about. Again, it wouldn't be in the book if it was written before that time. So it helps to, to analyze a little bit of, of beforehand. So the most likely date, a lot of people talk about 1960, uh, 8063, uh, but uh, there's, a, so there's a bit of room for maneuver there between 8062 to 64. Uh, Paul uh, has not yet died. Uh, the temple uh, hasn't been destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 8070. Uh, so that puts it before AD 70, but after AD 46, after the famine. So you've got a period in there. Um, it seems like the book would not have mentioned the structure of Jerusalem in AD 70 if that hadn't happened. Acts 119 talks about Jerusalem as though it has not yet been destroyed. Schofield, in his, uh, he's, got, he's a big writer, and he writes in his book, he says, this book covers the first 32 years after the death of Jesus. So uh, you can imagine... Uh, uh, that gives us a, 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 a rough idea then that the book was written around 62 to 64 AD. A little bit of flexibility in there. And there's a lot of stuff involved in that. Uh, talk about Paul. Paul was put in prison. He spent two years in prison at one point. Um, some people in the writing say, oh, Paul only went to prison once, one time. 
uh, other to say, no, Paul had two uh, periods in prison. And uh, obviously, as it was before his death, uh, the, the book was probably 63, uh, around, that, around that period. So the historical period uh, covered would be from, in the book of Acts, is from 29 to 33 years. So roughly about that time. So you're talking about the death of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, which we're going to deal with in Acts chapter 1, the beginning there. So Jesus going back to heaven, and then uh, the church being established on the first day of Pentecost. And uh, from that period on, uh, we see Peter taking the gospel message out and some of the dealings he has with people in the first century. And then we, we see Stephen uh, uh, as he dies. Uh, and then later on again, continue with Peter and the first Gentile convert, Cornelius. And then it goes on and the story breaks up. Uh, the Apostle Paul comes on the scene. Three missionary journeys where the Apostle Paul goes all over the place, including his imprisonments and things like that. Uh, and roughly you're talking about 33 years. What an impact upon the world. In 33 years, basically, these people have turned the world upside down. They really had a... We, we today are sitting here uh, believing in Jesus Christ because of the work of these first Christians. Because of the work of these, primarily the work of some of these apostles. That doesn't tell you about all the other work that's done by the other apostles throughout other parts of the empire. Uh, and yet, so the book of Acts, a historical book, uh, covers this uh, this period. Um, oh, that's that's dealing with uh, yes, after his imprisonment and stuff like that. Uh, this is this the Apostle Paul later on. He lived there for two whole years. You know, what expense? He went from all who came to him. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the as you taught said, taught about the Lord Jesus Christ uh, quite openly and unhindered. Here's the Apostle Paul, actually a prisoner. <coughs> But it's like an open prison because he's been condemned. He's been accused, first of all, of a crime. Uh, and under under Roman law, if you were to be accused of a crime, if you uh, he, he actually said, it, and you'll see it in the text as we come to it, uh, he, he goes to Rome. He, he claims that he wants to be um, uh, judged from Rome. Uh, and so they, they take him to Rome. Uh, we're just dealing with the book of Romans in the, in the school here. And uh, in the first chapter in the book of Romans, Paul turned around and said, I would like to go to Rome. I, I want to go to Rome. Uh, but he went in a, a way he didn't expect. He was, went as a prisoner. Uh, he didn't go on a holiday, holiday in coach or whatever it was. Um, he went as a prisoner. But when he got to Rome, you see by the letters he wrote to the different churches from Rome that it was a kind of open prison to, to a degree. <coughs> but he had a certain amount of freedom within that uh, to be able to do that. And obviously, under Roman law, if your prosecutors, if, you, if the ones who are accusing you, didn't come within two years and back up that accusation, then uh, you were free to go. And we think that's what probably happened uh, in the case of the Apostle Paul. And we'll deal with that uh, a little bit later. Sounds good. That's about round, back, round, round the wrong way, but that's okay. Uh, 29 to 30 years. That first one can go. From the ascension of Christ, then, all the way through to Paul's second probably second in prison, prisoner, AD 62, 63. So the book's definitely within that uh, sphere. Some uh, Roman emperors uh, are mentioned in the book, and that's part of the historical accuracy of, the, uh, the, of Luke. Uh, Tiberius, uh, he's quite famous. We ever seen, well, it's a, it's a rather, rather risque program that's on TV, uh, or just been on the, the uh, history of Rome or something it's called. Uh, it's a bit uh, rude in parts. But overall, the people that it's enacted in that, uh, you'll, you'll see some of these people. And if you like the, the film I, Claudius, or any of those programs, uh, you see an excellent uh, in-view into the life and, and times of, of the people who lived in that first, first uh, century. So Tiberius is one of them. Uh, this is a really, really nice guy to look at. Everybody writes really good things about him. Uh, I don't think so. But anyway, he was a real animal, basically. Uh, Power crops, absolute power crops, absolutely. And he took it on, hook, line, and sinker. And you weren't safe within, I would think, a hundred miles of him if you, if you got his wrong side. Uh, the intrigue, I mean, th these are the men that are mentioned. Some of the women, some of the wives are real uh, vicious creatures, well, to say the least. Uh, you certainly weren't safe if you, if you drank one of the chalices, you had to you know, give it to somebody else fast, see if they drop dead, then you'd feel safe to drink. Uh, they were so horrendous, some of these women in power, because they wanted their sons or, or to get into positions of power, and so they eliminated the, the, the opposition. What a nice bunch of people. Uh, so it's a, it's a, there's a lot of good books out there. I've read at least 
three books uh, based on the life of Claudius, uh, which is, were very interesting. And um, there's a lot of good, good stuff on, on the life of some of these people. And uh, that's the period then that uh, Luke's writing about, the historical period that the, the church grew up in. Uh, and it also is some of the people who gave the Christians in the first century a real hard time, a real bad time. And um, so, hopefully as the book can progress, we'll see some of that. And we saved the best to last, didn't we? Eh? Good old Neil, uh, fiddling where Rome burns, or so they say. Okay? Uh, he, wasn't, he certainly wasn't one of the nicest people to the Christians, uh, and there were persecutions definitely under his, his period. Uh, and so Luke writes within that, uh, that framework, and that gives us a historical background to the overall thing. Uh, who received the book? Who, who, who are the recipients of the book that uh, Luke wrote? Obviously, historically, time had gone on. Uh, and uh, so who are going to be the likely readers of the first century uh, book of Acts? Well, obviously, the first uh, Christians were. And by implication, then, us. Because here we are 2,000 years later, and what are we doing? We're reading the book of Acts, which is what we'll get next week. Uh, so there's an application both for them and their life uh, as a historical background, and we'll look at it again as we as we go into the uh, background of um, uh, what uh, who's writing to. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll have a look at that in, in Acts chapter one. So we see from Acts chapter one to nine, Peter is prominent. Uh, Acts chapters ten to twenty-eight, Paul is prominent. So the book is almost split evenly in two, and uh, an approximate chronology. I think we'll save that till next week, probably. That might be the best thing. We'll leave you, leave you with that there. The excitement, you'll be like neighbours. You, you can't wait to come back. <laughs> I don't want to do many technical flaws in that tonight. Let's change. All right. No right. questions, then? Yes, you can. Well, do you know, if, you, if you've got any, if you've got yeah. any questions on that, yeah. 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 Uh, 